th this is the thing is we live in a world where we don't say what we're thinking. We say what we think people want to hear. If life is not going the way that I think it should be going, it's because I'm resisting what is. Everything comes down to the decisions that you make. We all know what to do. None of us know how to make ourselves do it. I went from getting up on time and waking up on time to shaking up my entire life. Because when you understand the power of a five second decision, and you understand that you always have a choice to go from autopilot to decision maker, everything in your life will change. You will be a different negotiator, you will be different in sales, you will be unstoppable in the gym, because you will realize the amount of garbage that you put in the way of your hopes, of your dreams, of your potential, of your confidence, of your courage. Once you get over the fear of being embarrassed, you know, no, no one likes to be embarrassed, but once you get over being scared of being embarrassed, it's super liberating. And it allows you to go into lanes that you, otherwise you wouldn't go into. And everybody's wired differently. You know, everybody's wired completely different. It's hard to rewire someone to, take, to, to be, you know, comfortable taking risks, comfortable with being embarrassed. And I think it comes from having a lot of egg on your face and learning along the way. If I ever feel like in any moment life is not going the way that I think it should be going, it's because I'm resisting what is. Someone didn't turn in their work on time and I'm just like, you know, getting that way or something didn't come out right or the delivery doesn't come or the technology breaks again. We can list anything in that slot, right? It's me arguing with reality. I'm making myself miserable in that moment because I'm choosing to argue with what is. That's always a losing proposition. So the more awareness I can bring to that and go like, is this really how you want to live your life in this moment, Marie? Because every single moment, as you know, sets you up for the next moment. And you string these moments together and guess what? You have your life until we get to that incredible deathbed. We never know when that's coming. So every single moment is an opportunity for us to check ourselves before we wreck ourselves. And so I just try and play the game. If I'm miserable, if I'm upset, if I'm angry, if I'm cranky, it is my responsibility because it's based on what I'm thinking or believing in that moment. It's not the outside world causing me to feel this. It's what I'm doing up here that's making me have that reaction. And if I'm the problem, I am also the solution. Do you have a roof over your head right now? Yes, then things are damn good. Is there some food in the fridge? You're probably luckier than millions of people on the planet right now. Is there running water in the kitchen and in the bathroom? Yes, again, you're better off than probably a billion people or more. So that little reframe helps me. And then in the moment, again, it sounds so simple, but I think we're all searching for these really complex things and we don't need them. If you can catch yourself arguing with reality in the moment and realize that's not a wise thing to do, you can then back yourself up and go, okay, that didn't turn out right, so what am I gonna do about it? Am I gonna be miserable in this moment and let this ruin my night? Or am I gonna send off the email to say, hey, when's that work gonna come? And let's readjust our communication plan so this doesn't happen again. But the argument and the irritation is not necessary to get a new result. You know, I think you can always get in that super grind mode, that, that real push, that sprint to get things done. But as in any sprint, if you're an athlete running a, you know, quarter mile, you're going to need recovery after that, you know? And I think that's something that we can sometimes fail to recognize that you don't actually get stronger when you're sprinting, you get stronger when you recover. And I think the psyche is just the same as the body in that we perform best when we have periods where we push and then periods where we reflect, integrate, recover. And so for me, it's just been listening to what works for me. You know, I can continue to grind and continue to perform worse and worse and worse, or I can take the opportunities when I'm inspired and push really hard and then take those next phases to recover, adapt and try and come back the next time and sprint even faster, sprint even farther. But it's just finding that balance that's really effective for me to get what I need to get done. And how do you find that? Like, is there an internal uh, self-awareness that you've cultivated or? Yeah, there's like a natural sense to find balance. And I think we all have that. I think we know it. We just override that voice. We're like, oh, more coffee or oh, more something else to 
hide the signals that our body is naturally telling us. Like our body is constantly giving us clues. But the problem is it comes with a whisper. And we can drown out that whisper in a million different ways with distraction, with you know, mental processes, with you know, physical things like, like I said, drinking coffee or taking Adderall or doing whatever you need to do to drown out that sound that says, hey, really you need to sleep. You know, like that's really what your body is asking for. And so I think it's really just tuning in to what you need and being able to listen to that voice and not only hear it, but follow through on what it says. And the research shows that people should have some alone time and then some time to collaborate or be with other people. And the healthy balance of both is really important. If you're constantly around other people, right, the, the new research shows that open offices are bad for human interactions. So if you're not getting your alone time, if you're always hearing and seeing people in the office, you're very distracted. Um, but if you're not getting that and you don't get any human interaction, that extreme can hurt you as well. So it's a healthy balance. It's going to be a little bit different from everyone. Like if you're an introvert, you probably need a little bit less. Uh, so men are lonely, introverts are lonely, uh, and then younger people are, are lonelier than senior citizens. It's, it's really remarkable and I think it's partially because of technology because I think it's hard to be very empathetic and have a strong connection if you don't see and hear someone for a long period of time. And people default to using their devices, right? And so people tap their phones over 2,600 times a day. They look at their phones every 12 minutes. Um, they're using their phones all hours. They're sleeping with their phones, which isn't healthy. And so we just have to be really smart about how we're using this technology. And what I say in the book and the core of what I'm trying to get across is use technology as a bridge to human interaction. Don't let it be a barrier to the very relationships that you need to survive. It's not just about work. It's about survival. So I make a huge case for work friendships. This is the thing is, we live in a world where we don't say what we're thinking, we say what we think people want to hear. Um, I feel like if I planned ahead, you wouldn't be hearing me. You'd be hearing something I prepared. Mm. And if I was doing something that I prepared, it would be because I want to get something from someone. You know, we say, am I doing this right? Am I doing this wrong? That question implies there is a right or wrong way. And how do you measure that? Like, did it sell something? Did people like it? Did I get approval from the audience? So I also feel that in the moment, we're always feeling something. Mm. Like, if you just say what you're feeling, then you actually create a space where the person across from you or the audience goes, oh, I know what that feels like, and I can connect with you. But in trying to prepare something, often we block what we're feeling and then bring something that we prepared earlier in the day, and people miss out on the real you. I had started a career in direct sales and I learned something in my training from my manager called the five minute rule. And he said that when you're out there in the, in the field, you're going to have disappointment, you're going to have rejection, you're going to set a goal for the week, you're not going to hit it, you're going to hit it and then have the order cancel. Like he's like, you're going to deal with a lot of stuff. It's a microcosm for life. And he taught us what he calls the five minute rule. He said, so when things go wrong, we have a rule. It's okay to be negative, but not for more than five minutes. You give yourself five minutes, set your timer on your phone. You would literally teach us at the timer, you get five minutes to moan, complain, cry, vent, punch a wall, whatever. And after five minutes, you take a deep breath and say three really powerful words, can't change it. And it's simply an acknowledgement that I can't change what's already happened. So there's no value in wishing it were different. And, and essentially I learned through reading Eckhart Tolle and things through years after that every negative emotion that we have is self-created by the degree of resistance that we have to our reality whether it's past reality, whether it's happening right now, or whether it's even a projected future reality that we're afraid of. So I was 20 when I had the car accident. And so in the span of five minutes, I woke up, I was told I would never walk again. You know, I had 11 broken bones, uh, permanent brain damage, and I went, well, can't change it. I, and I, I told my dad, I said, dad, there's two possibilities. Number one, the doctors are right and I'll never walk again. And I've already decided, I've imagined that possibility. Okay, I'm in a wheelchair the rest of my life. I promise I'll be the happiest person you've ever seen in a wheelchair. Because I'm in a wheelchair either way, I'm gonna be happy, I'll be grateful. Why be miserable just because that's my unchangeable circumstance? And I said the possibility number two is I will walk again. And I don't even know if it's possible, but I do know that that's what I want. So I've accepted the worst case scenario, I'm at peace with it, and all of my energy is going into walking again. And a week later the doctors came in with routine x-rays. And they said, we don't know how to explain this, but your body is healing so quickly we're gonna let you take your first step tomorrow. And that was three weeks after the accident. It went from like never walking again and then 
I took my first step the next day. Every adversity that I've had since then, I'm able to leverage the lesson of, hey, if I can't change it, the only intelligent choice I have if I want to be happy is to accept it.